juice. What are you going to do? It's Halloween. Fuck out of here. Uh, we are going to get into the Rico aspect of this. Uh, the reason why I'm really truly covering this is, is like I said, I, I like to educate people. And I think there's, you constantly see people on these mob genre shows and they say, oh, Rico laws are unconstitutional. And they never really tell you why. They never even really tell you what the RICO law is because, frankly, I don't think they know what the fuck the RICO law is. I don't think they understand the depths of an indictment. I, I just, and I'm not knocking them. That's just what they do. Uh, but my thing is, is if you're going to talk about organized crime, you need to know like every facet of it, even the legal side of that. You have to understand. You can't just look at an indictment and read it. Uh, read the pages and go, oh, wow, look, these guys are in big trouble. That's not always the fucking case. I mean, an indictment, listen, it's not fun shit. It's not all peanuts and fireworks up your ass, let me tell you. But at the end of the day, you have to understand uh, what what you're talking about. Uh, and I just think at the end of the day, if you're not going to offer your listeners at least an understanding, like a part of my job, a part of my job is to do the hard work, right? I do the hard work and I bring it to you so that you don't have to look this up. So you don't have to like take your time. That's one of the things I like doing. Uh, and so one of the things that you hear these New Yorkers, all they do is honk their fucking horns. I swear to God, they honk at fucking nothing. It's the Brooklyn toot. You know what the Brooklyn toot is? The Brooklyn toot is when the light turns yellow on the other side, the motherfuckers start honking. Go, go, go. Ah, forget about it. Uh, but anyway... So I, I think that we need to, you know, talk about RICO in terms of what the law is, how it works, how it functions, and how the FBI uses it in an indictment. Uh, this is going to be a two-part show. Uh, the second half of this will be definitely uh, next week. And we'll talk specifically about the Philadelphia indictment a little bit next week. And we're going to talk about it a little bit today. Uh, but if you're not interested in, in this, then I apologize. But this is something that means something to me. It means something to me because I've always said you help your friends, you do what you can. Uh, if you're going to talk about the mafia, you're going to talk about RICO laws. If you're going to talk about, well, 12 guys got indicted. Well, why don't you tell your audience what they got indicted for? Because that makes all the difference. Uh, and so with all that, we're going to get started and, 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 uh, it's going to be a little long winded. I apologize for that, but I'll try to make it exciting. Uh, maybe I'll set my hair on fire. <laughs> uh, so listen, like I said earlier, this is a topic that I've briefly touched on in, in some capacity over the years. Uh, I've never really on this show taken a deep dive into the capacity of what RICO laws are and how, how they're unconstitutional. Uh, you always hear people, like I said earlier, screaming about how this law is, is, isn't is constitutional, but nobody ever really talks about why. What are the reasons for that? Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go into a deep, a complete deep dive on every little facet of RICO, uh, and, uh, but this is going to be a little legalese at times, uh, but I'll try to make it not so much overbearing. Uh, but I just want to talk for a little bit about the law, and I want to apply it, like I said earlier, to the specific indictment in South Philadelphia. It's not just uh, the RICO laws, but it's how they use it to bob and weave and indict people who often aren't even involved in the case that is being brought against 10 to 15 other people. Uh, that is what the RICO law allows room for. It allows for men to be indicted who may not have even known about the crime being committed or even being involved uh, we have talked before that it is not a federal crime or a state crime to be a member of any secret group. Meanwhile, when you look at how the RICO law is weaved or you look at it on its basis, uh, they are in fact using it for and against secret groups. Uh, it's the wordage uh, that a lot of legal scholars have fought over over the years. Uh, and I'm going to draw as many direct parallels as I can. Uh, so we will sort of deep dive into the, the Philadelphia mob indictment a little bit because there are some seriously shady fucking things going on with this indictment. Uh, so if you ever wanted to experience, you know, what I go through while pe peeling back layers of an indictment, this is going to be the show you want to listen to. Some names in the indictment I'm just not going to mention. 
Uh, most of the names I will talk about, but some of them I'm not. And, and this is also not going to be centrally focused uh, on informants, uh, because I, while that is a serious part, and a neglectful part of the process, I don't want to necessarily focus on that, because without the law, you can't do this shit anyway. Uh, informants are always going to be a part of indictments. Like I just said, they're always going to be a part of the dialogue. But I want to do this a little bit differently. Uh, and it's not going to be the overwhelming feature of what we are going to talk about. <clears throat> so what is the RICO Act, right? Uh, for those that know and those that don't know, it's the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act. Uh, it was actually called RICO after the Edward G. Robinson movie. Uh, by the name of Little Caesar. Uh, Edward G. Robinson played a character in that film named Rico. Uh, and this act or this law was designed directly to go after organized crime. Obviously, today we have seen it being utilized in different ways, but it's traditionally the way they go after the mob. Uh, the RICO Act was enacted in Section 901A of the Organized Crime Control Act of 1970. Uh, Robert Blakely, who was an advisor to the United States Senate Government Operations Com Committee, uh, had drafted this law under the close supervision of John McClellan. Uh, it would be signed into law by Richard Nixon in 1970, and its sole main purpose was to use the law to defeat the mob. That's just the truth. Uh, by 1972, 33 states had adopted state RICO laws to enable prosecutors uh, to indict uh, similar crimes. Uh, under the RICO law, a person who has committed at least two acts of racketeering activity uh, drawn from a list of 35 crimes, uh, 27 federal crimes and eight state crimes within a 10-year period can be charged with racketeering if those acts are related in one of four specific ways to an enterprise. Now, don't get confused by all this. We're, we're going to clean it up here in a minute. Uh, those found guilty of racketeering can be fined up to $25,000, can be sentenced to 20 years in prison per racketeering count. So you always hear people when they talk about RICO acts getting triple the time. And this is why, because the, there's different predicate acts, different penalties for different things, but it allows the law to be all encompassing, meaning you're going to get triple the fucking time uh, but we're going to get into more into this. Uh, in, in addition, uh, the person uh, who is convicted of being involved in racketeering must forfeit all gotten gains and interest in any business gained through a pattern of racketeering activity. Uh, when the U.S. attorney decides to indict somebody under the RICO Act, they have the option of seeking a pretrial restraining order or an injunction to temporarily seize the defendant's assets and prevent the transfer of potentially forfeitable property as well as require the defendant to put up a performance bond. This provision was placed in the law because the owners of mafia-related shell corporations often took off with all of the assets. An injunction or performance bond ensures that there is something to seize in the event of a guilty verdict. So in other words, being accused of it, they can seize all your assets right then and there. A little prejudicial to me. We'll talk more in depth about that here in a few minutes. Uh, in many cases, uh, the threat of RICO indictment can force defendants to plead guilty to lesser charges, in part, and the reason this is important, because the seizure of assets would make it difficult uh, to pay a defense attorney. So if they seize your assets, they freeze your bank accounts, guess what a defendant can't do? He can't go out and get the high-dollar lawyer who's really going to fight for his cause. Uh, and it's bullshit. Uh, in Italy, specifically, they, they can take your assets and never give them back. Uh, just being accused. This is very similar to that. Uh, despite the fact that it has harsh provisions in the RICO Act, uh, a RICO-related charge is, is considered easy to prove in court since it focuses on patterns of behavior as opposed to criminal acts. So they're focusing more on, oh, we think he did A, B, C, D, and E, rather than saying he did A, B, and C. They focus on a multitude of different things because in the RICO Act, they have to all be sort of connected. Uh, RICO also permits a private individual uh, damaged in his business or property by a racketeer to file a civil suit, which is... Uh, nonsense. The plaintiff must prove the existence of the enterprise. Now, using the term enterprise is we're weaving words. It's weaving words into 
uh, they, they call it an enterprise, but in reality, what they mean is a club or a group organized crime. Uh, the defendants uh, are not in the enterprise. In other words, the defendants in the enterprise are not one and the same. There must be one of four specific relationships between the defendant and the enterprise. Either the, the defendants invested the proceeds uh, from that in a pattern of, pattern of racketeering uh, activity into the enterprise uh, or they have acquired or maintained an interest in or control of the enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity or the defendants conducted or participated in the affairs of the enterprise through a pattern of racketeering or the defendant conspired to do one of the above in essence the enterprise is either the prize, the instrument, the victim, or the perpetrator of the racketeers. A civil RICO action can be filed in state or federal court. Both the criminal and the civil components allow the recovery of what they call treble damages. Treble damages are triple the amount of actual uh, compensatory damages. So they can triple your fines, triple uh, what you would normally get in another civil matter. Uh, now, what we know, uh, we know how RICO operates, right? There's a lot of flaws and a lot of un un excuse me, unconstitutional shit that goes on with RICO charges. One of the RICO law's biggest issues is that most of the victims of this law were not even the original intended targets. And that's the thing I want you to focus on, is that the RICO law's biggest issue is that most of the victims of this law were never the intended targets, and the law states that a defendant doesn't even have to know the details of a crime, uh, meaning that they are lopped in with others, even if they committed no crime. You tell me how that's constitutional. Uh, one of the other main reasons why the RICO law was invented was because state, this is a big one, you're going to love this part. One of the other main reasons why RICO was invented was because state and local governments and the federal government were losing state cases big time state cases and they needed to find a way to get more conviction more convictions and, and and less acquittals and that is a fact rico in effect has enabled federal prosecutors in effect to circumvent the constitutional separation between national and state governments where once uh, there was a clear and, and uh, there was once uh, clear and transparent boundaries that were drawn between national and state and federal have now all been erased. And those who get indicted under RICO statutes find themselves on the federal docket with almost 0% chance of gaining an acquittal. So as RICO come, came into a, a sort of an effect, or as, as it came together, its objective was to prevent the infiltration of organized crime into legitimate businesses. RICO would give the government a powerhouse with a whole bunch, a whole new set of powers which included freezing the assets of a defendant as the indictment drops, which means that the defendants don't have any access to cash or money to hire reputable attorneys. In many cases, they have to put their homes up as collateral. Its design is to handicap defense defendants out of the gate, handicap them immediately so they can't defend themselves correctly. Uh, you know, keep in mind, an indictment doesn't mean you're guilty. It's an accusation. Therefore, how can you justifiably see somebody's assets based on just an accusation? It also applies pressure, not just to the defendant, but to his family as well, which would include children, wives, etc. The government is authorized to act as judge and jury in that same case. The government under RICO is able to make it almost impossible for a defendant to wage a correct and fair, balanced defense against the government god forbid they get convicted <laughs> you know rico provides the government with the ability to, to cripple them financially so on its end rico was created uh to enable the federal government to avoid state courts which historically if you look at the case records uh accused mob guys typically get prosecuted in state court okay uh, you know, also alleged mob figures or whatever the case may be, they were gaining a lot of acquittals in state court, as we said earlier. But often they were gaining acquittals in cases which there was a 
beyond a preponderance of the evidence against them, also with overwhelming evidence of guilt. So the government formed a new set of derivative crimes, a new class of crimes and offenses that are derived from other criminal acts. So in other words, they're stacking the fucking deck because they don't want to lose cases. So how does the RICO law lay itself out and how does the government use it against defendants? Because that's one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't talk about. So RICO declares it a crime to use income derived from a pattern of racketeering activity to acquire an interest in an enterprise affecting interstate commerce, uh, acquire or maintain an interest affecting interstate commerce through a pattern of racketeering activity, conduct, or participation through a pattern of racketeering, excuse me, racketeering, ugh, racketeering activity in the affairs of an enterprise affecting interstate commerce, conspiring to carry out any of the, any of the following actions. What's amusing is that RICO does not require intent, recklessness, state of mind, willingness, or even knowledge uh, on the part of the accused. That simply means just being associated with it, being near it, being around it, even if you didn't even fucking have direct involvement and never took a dime from it, you're guilty as fuck. How is that even legal? What, is, what the government has done is they have snuck in a whole list of crimes within the RICO package. Uh, these would be called predicate acts. Under RICO state, under RICO, uh, state laws of offenses now become federal offenses, such as kidnapping and murder, bribery, mail fraud, and etc. Racketeering is defined as carrying on an illegal business, uh, illegal business activities that involve crimes. The government RICO definition of racketeering is any act or threat involving, and then they drop many criminal acts under a lump sum so it's all about just hammering and hammering and hammering uh you know uh, rico statute defines an enterprise because we're going to talk a lot about enterprise today but the rico statute defines enterprise as including any individual partnership cooperation association that's a big word. I want you to kind of keep that keep that on the back burner. Or any other legal entity in any union or group of individuals associated in the fact, although not a legal entity. In other words, if you're associated with anybody that's involved in a club or what they call a club, it is therefore an enterprise. It's a word switch. That's all this is. Uh, and right there, I have an issue. It's not illegal to be a member of any group, albeit the fucking Boy Scouts, the fucking Cub Scouts, the, the fucking Masons, the Seven Day Adventists, the Mafia, whatever the fuck. It is not illegal. It's not even illegal to be a terrorist, to be in a terrorist cell. Uh, what this does when RICO is applied is, in effect, it makes it a criminal charge. Now, they're going to say that's not the case, but that is the case. And that's going to lead me to the first page of the Philadelphia indictment. This is very important. On one hand, you have no statute, albeit state or federal, which makes it, which makes being a part of any group a crime. But RICO has a bypass to this. And we're going to talk about that. In any indictment, okay, it always begins the same. And this is the part I want you to pay attention to. And you could say I'm using wordplay, but I, listen, I'm just telling you how it is. So in any indictment, it's always the same, specifically in terms of organized crime. It begins with the quote unquote, the enterprise. Uh, we have already talked about what the government terms uh, as an enterprise and what makes it okay to them. Uh, then the indictment names the defendants and underneath it begins a tapestry of weaving and bobbing, lopping all the defendants into a historical dissertation on what the fuck they think the mafia is alleged to be. And so just briefly, I'm going to read to you what it says. Uh, just so you have an understanding, now keep in mind, it is not illegal to be part of a member or to be a part of any fringe group or secret group. It's not even illegal to be in a terrorist organization in this country, like I said. So I'm going to read from the indictment. The defendants were members and associates of the Philadelphia family of La Cosa Nostra, Philadelphia La Cosa Nostra, or the Enterprise. So right away, they're telling you the Enterprise is a secret group. 
but it's not illegal to be a secret group. So what the fuck is the point? So right off the bat, they're establishing that they're in a group. The formation of that group is not illegal by the, the law, by state or federal law, but is now called an enterprise. Calling it an enterprise makes it illegal. The Philadelphia LCN is a criminal organization operating in eastern Pennsylvania, the southern uh, district of New Jersey, whose members engage in illegal acts of illegal gambling, loan sharking, drug trafficking, and extortion for the purposes of enriching the organization and its members. An organization and membership is not illegal. The Philadelphia La Cosa Nostra, including the leadership members and associates, constitutes as an enterprise as defined by Title 18 United States Code Section 1961. That is a group of individuals associated, although not a legal entity. The enterprise constitutes constitutes an ongoing organization whose members function as a continuing unit for the common purpose of achieving the objective of the enterprise. The enterprise engages in activities that affect interstate and foreign commerce. What the fuck are they doing? Shipping oil to Kuwait? How is this a fucking foreign commerce? What the fuck are they doing? Hey, Jimmy, bring me the pallets of the oil. We stole it from Kuwait. Who's doing that? Stupid. There is nothing foreign about the foreign about this enterprise. That's number one. Okay, number two, it's fucking wordsmithing by the federal government at its best. Once again, it's not illegal to be a member of anything, right? Meanwhile, they weave in Bob words in effect, making it illegal to be a member of a group under the guise of their own definition of what they think an enterprise is. So in other words, if uh, Joey Merlino, who's an alleged boss of the, the, the Philadelphia Mafia, decides to make, we're going to make our mob family a legal organization. It's legal. So because they do that in title, now it's not, now it's not against the law. Because if you listen to the words themselves, they, they use legal entity as the phrase. So, Joey, if you're listening, any mob guys out there, make your crime family, make the Gambino crime family dot LLC. Then they can't go after you because now you've made it a legit business on paper. Do you see how stupid this is? Oh. So then they go on to give a complete and utter vomit-inducing history lesson on organized crime, its roots, its origins, and the structure. This is imperative for the government to do, and there's a reason why they do this. The average person in America, they know what the mafia is. They aren't glued, to, they, they aren't glued super glued to the couch their entire lives. They've seen movies. They've seen pil- uh, films. They've read articles, and in my opinion, it's prejudicial to set the standard that way. You are essentially giving a historical, non-factual version of events on the origins of what the government says the mafia is. They aren't setting the stage to bypass the legality of groups. They're also setting the stage for the hierarchical formations, which is very, very, very important to them. Because when they use wiretaps, then they use informants, and they use transcripts to base their cases on, they have to follow the logic Uh, that someone gave the order from day one to day two. They don't understand that some mob guys don't give a fuck and they'll do whatever they want. If the rule is don't sell drugs, they're going to go out and do it anyway because they got to earn. They got to put money in the bank. They got to put food on their fucking plate. They got to take care of the kids. They got to put kids in college. And we're going to get specifically to that that heresy because that's what that is next week because there's a couple of things in this indictment in philadelphia that you're not going to believe <laughs> i'm telling you uh but they have to follow a certain logic from day one they don't talk about the sicilian vespers when they're doing their fucking little dissertation in court to a fucking grand jury because the reality is is if you understand where the mafia originally came from it didn't start necessarily as a criminal group it morphed into that but there were reasons why this happened and for anybody that's curious Look up the Sicilian Vespers and you will totally fucking understand everything. But the government doesn't talk about that. They want to talk about murder and mayhem and Paul Castellano and man, man, go fuck your mothers. So the structure, one of the biggest issues, specifically in the way that the, the, the Philadelphia indictment weaves is through structure. The only way that they can lop everybody into a crime and bypass the illegality 
of prosecuting a group is by establishing a structure, albeit hierarchical. So in other words, they cannot use the RICO law effectively without that. And the example uh, in this would be person A is the boss. They issue an order. Therefore, anybody underneath that person who commits any overt act can be charged uh, can be charged from the boss to the underboss to the consigliere. Even if a fringe jerk off commits a crime, everybody's going to be charged. The problem with that thought process is that many mob guys or alleged mob guys, they, like I said earlier, they do as they want. They break the fucking rules. They do as they see fit. So if they break rules, how is that even a fucking organization? If they say, well, he's the boss and anything that, that is done is directly going back to him. How is that true? How is that possible? They do as they see fit, but because the government has established a chain of command and a chain of leadership, they can use RICO to bend defendants in any fucking way that they want. They can bend the jury any way they want with little to no pushback. Page four, statement six from the Philadelphia indictment. Crews consist of soldiers and associates. Soldiers have members of the family who have been formally initiated members into La Cosa Nostra through a ritual called the making ceremony. I would love to be at a mob trial and hear this bullshit. I would lose my shit and just start laughing out loud. Once again, it's not illegal. The Masons have a fucking, uh, the Masons have a ritual. Is that illegal? The Masons do some illegal ass shit they have historically speaking. But that's not illegal. And as a result of that initiation, they are called made members of La Cosa Nostra. As a part of a making ceremony, <laughs> a soldier swears his allegiance to La Cosa Nostra above all other interests and obligations, including his biological family. He swears a vow of secrecy. Can I explain something to you? This is how stupid this shit is. They've watched way too many TV shows. A ritual in many ways... Or an oath, just like an oath to office. I swear to do the, the duty and all of this nonsense. How many fucking presidents have taken an oath of office and fucking done horrible, awful shit? All right? I don't know of one mob guy, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know of a single fucking mob guy who has had a beef with one of his captains because his captain's daughter has cancer and she's dying and they need something taken care of. Never in the existence of the mafia has it ever happened where they said, well, I'm sorry, but we have this going on, so let your kid die alone. Never in the history of the mafia has that ever fucking happened. But yet they want to weave to the jury system that, because what that does is that shows these people don't care about their own family. They don't care if their daughter has cancer. All they care about is murder and mayhem and greed. And that's not true. So right out the fucking gate, when you get a grand jury subpoena and they're doing the preliminary shit to indict somebody, this is the nonsense the government is filling with people. This is what they're filling their minds up with. No wonder why you think they're a fucking monster. Because the history lesson that the government wants to teach really isn't a fucking accurate one. Do you see where this is going? It's not illegal. And they're painting a picture of demons in the closet. They are weaving language designed to show a prospective jury that they have things to hide. Allegations are allegations, but they weave words to give the impression that being in a secret group somehow is illegal and somehow supports their goofy fucking accusations. Loan sharking is always a part of any mob or alleged mob indictment. It's always going to be there. Loan sharking on its heels always makes me kind of laugh. Uh, the definition in this indictment by the government hands over is the following. A debt which is incurred and contracted in gambling activity, uh, which was incurred in connection with the business of gambling, which activity and businesses were in violation of laws of the United States and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the state of New Jersey, and has a debt which was unforeseeable under state and federal law in whole and in part to principle and interest because of the lies 
relating to unsure and which was incurred in connection with the business of lending money at a rate of unserious under state and federal law where the unserious rate was at least twice the lawfully enforceable rate. So they jam this down the jury's throat with a lot of fancy fucking words and a lot of following phrases. It was a part of the conspiracy that each defendant in this indictment agreed that a conspirator would commit at least one collection of unlawful debt in the conduct of affairs of the enterprise. (laughs) How can you even say that? Every single one of these people would commit at least one act of this. Common sense, please. In South Philadelphia, common sense in general. How many loan sharks do you think are in the mob? 100 guys. Out of 100 guys, how many do you think are loan sharking? I'll tell you the reality. Probably 20. But no, not in this. All 15. At least we're going to commit one act. We're going to commit versus committing are two different fucking things. So you see what they're doing, right? They're taking away... uh, a group or a club and they're substituting it once again with the word enterprise it's their way once again of bypassing that it's not illegal to be in a group but they reform the sentence and they make it illegal it also shows how they can charge all the defendants with loan shark and not all of them are loan sharking there's 14 defendants one of them passed away in this particular case so you mean to tell me that all 14 defendants in this indictment were loan sharking do the feds even understand that not everybody uh is loan sharking in the streets do you have any idea what kind of money that is how much was lended by each defendant then their words uh are each defendant but it's not every defendant in this case maybe two but because they can lop everybody under the term enterprise everybody's getting charged with it they can use group structure everybody's getting fucked in the ass Remember earlier we said that in most cases, defendants are charged with crimes they had no knowledge of, nor the, nor they participated in. This is a glowing fucking example of how RICO and the Fed used the law to ensnare dozens of people. Do they understand how much money flows into the fucking streets? Do they understand that this is not fucking Amway? <laughs> so loan sharking, right? There is no law in society. That prohibits anybody from lending anybody else money. If you use overt uh, violence to collect money, then yeah, it's illegal. However, in this case, there's no violence, no intent of violence, no threat of violence. The government's stance is that it's a repayment of the loan is double. Therefore, it's unlawful. Have any of you ever had a fucking mortgage? Have any of you ever gotten a payday loan? Banks can legally charge and change your mortgage rates without even fucking telling you. And if you don't pay, guess what they do? They take your fucking house. It's okay for the banks to extend lines of money. They can inflate the rates with no oversight. And you're caught with the bill. They may not beat you up, but they will take your fucking home and ensure you never get a loan again. How about people who take out payday loans and are charged 40 to 60% as a fucking tax? How about how the bank charges you a $5 fee to cash a $10 fucking check that a bank, when you cash it at a bank that isn't fucking yours? Isn't that loan sharking? They claim that these loans are due to gambling debts, and, and really that's not the case. Have you ever loaned a family member money? Have you ever gotten a little bit pissed off when they didn't pay you back and you have words? Maybe you punch your brother in the face or something or you get nasty with each other. Is that loan sharking? What if it'll work? What if it work? A guy gives you $10 for lunch. He says, I keep the change and you can get me back next week. And the following week, he orders double what you paid. Is that loan sharking too? Is it illegal to loan some? It's not illegal to loan anybody money. It's not illegal for balloon payments at car dealerships that cripple people. The point I'm making is that it's perfectly acceptable for banks to rape, pillage, and plunder. But loaning a friend money and getting a little back, somehow that's illegal. They don't enforce the banks. They don't enforce the lenders. The government uses the term enterprise once again because it's they don't want to say group or club. Page 21, Act Number 74. This is how stupid this fucking indictment is. 
On or about August 14th of 2017, defendant Victor DeLuca handed a sum of money to defendant Salvatore Sonny Mazzone. How the fuck is anybody handing anyone money without the sum even being known? How is that even an illegal or overt predicate act? This is a... Who is he giving money to? You mean to tell me if I want... And I'll give you the scenario. I walk to a bar and say, hey, I didn't pay my tab last week. I was drunk. I'm sorry. Here's the money. I, that becomes loan sharking and a fucking extortion? How much money was transferred? A sum of money is not very specific to me. How the fuck can you take that line number 74? And I'll read it again. Uh, on or about August 14th of 2017, defendant Victor DeLuca handed a sum of money to defendant Salvatore Sonny Mazzone. He got indicted for that? How do you tell a fucking grand jury that shit and have them go, okay, that makes sense. Does nobody question these things? Because the first thing is, is a juror, I would go, well, how much money? How do you know that that was for a loan sharking? How do you know that was a payment to whoever? Do you have a tape? To, no, they don't have a tape. They're going on the words of somebody, probably an informant. But they don't even, they don't even state that in Act Number 74. How is that an overt predicate act? And this is a pure example of how the RICO law works. It's probably the best way it shows how RICO operates in functionality. Victor DeLuca allegedly walks into an establishment, doesn't utter a fucking word, and hands Sonny Mazzone money. Maybe Sonny has no idea what it is. Maybe DeLuca says, hey, this is from a bar bill. Maybe DeLuca, you know, because because DeLuca is named in the indictment, this becomes a conspiracy. And because of that, Sonny Mazzone gets dragged into the bullshit. Ever heard the phrase, I got 10 years for just saying hello to a motherfucker? This is an example of how this happens. There is nothing illegal about what Victor DeLuca did or what Sonny Mazzone did. But because they use the term conspiracy or enterprise and the way that Rico is used and worded, this is how it happens. Sonny Mazzone didn't have to be aware of the money, the pretenses, or even the reason. Just accepting it, just taking it from somebody else's hand, proves conspiracy in terms of how RICO works and acts. So let's go back to RICO for one second. Under the RICO Act, it is a crime to use income derived from the commission of at least two acts or threats involving any of the crimes listed in the statute to acquire an interest in any group or individuals associated, in fact, affecting interstate commerce. Appendix B, acquire or maintain an interest with any group of individuals associated, in fact, affecting interstate commerce. How does you giving me a loan fucking affect interstate commerce? What, because a prick don't go to a bank to get robbed and raped? Fuck out of here. Appendix Conduct or participation through at least two acts or threats involving any of the crimes or statutes or D conspiring to take any actions. So it's a crime to be in a group. It's a, it's a crime to be associated. Then it's a crime to participate. So you see how they word this three different ways to catch you. And I'll read it again, just because maybe I wasn't clear. Under RICO Act, it's a crime to use income derived from a commission of at least two acts or threats involving any of the crimes listed in the statute to acquire an interest in any group of individuals associated, in fact, in, uh, affecting interstate commerce. Appendix B, to acquire or maintain an interest in any group of individuals associated, in fact, affecting uh, interstate commerce through at least two acts involving uh, any of the crimes listed in the statute, Appendix uh, C, conduct or participating through at least two acts or threats involving any of the crimes or statutes or deconspiring to even take any actions. So it's a crime to be in a group, then it's a crime to be associated being a group within a group, and then it's a crime to, to even participate. So now there's three things you're getting hammered on for knowing, participating, and for being involved. So how is this legal? How or how is this? How 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 is why is this illegal to the feds? So violation under RICO is defined as participating in any group of individuals associated, no matter how loosely through commission of at least two other crimes. The truly wrongful acts in RICO are already criminalized under under other statutes. 
So the question really becomes is what does RICO add to the criminal code by making it a crime to associate with others through the commission of crimes? Uh, the end is that if the statutes in RICO are properly put into its own category, then truly nothing really honestly gained by making it a new and separate crime at the end of the day. And what they're doing is they're blindly sort of adding into law that it's illegal to associate with anybody who is committing crimes. Therefore, it's guilt by association more often than not. And that in and of itself is illegal and it's unconstitutional. But the RICO law used, uh, you know, uh, the RICO law used really just fucking hammers people. Uh, RICO is nothing more than a sentence enhancer, more than anything, and it's a tool used by the prosecution to obtain higher conviction rates. It's because uh, it's used as a bargaining tool for prosecutors. If a defendant in a RICO case has been charged with a predicate act, which carries a potential federal sentence, and the prosecutor takes the RICO act charge off the table, which would mean uh, taking a 20-year mandatory sentence off the table if they plead guilty to the predicate, predicate offense, then what is the defendant really left to do? It's because under RICO, you get triple the time for the first offense, never mind if you've ever been convicted prior to that in any case. So what if the prosecutor is using that against the defendant and he decides to take his chance at trial and says, fuck this, I'm not going to take a 20-year mandatory. Uh, But RICO sits in the background of all of that, enhancing everything. It's a no-win situation for a defendant. With the ease of using RICO, to join a trial or indict several and two defendants, it makes things almost virtually impossible, where in most cases, if RICO was not allowed, the prosecution would have issues putting all of it together under one umbrella, and it would it would make a trial so disjoined and chaotic uh, that, you know, it, it would be hard to put it under the same trial under the rules of evidence and criminal procedure. So there are a few tie downs at a prosecutor's willingness to do when dealing with RICO laws. Prosecutors have wide, wide options. It's their discretion as to what to charge because there's, you know, oh, well, let's not charge them with racketeering because that's soft. Let's charge them with this. They should be charged with everything. Uh, The last time I checked when I got arrested, they didn't just decide to throw the serious charges and give me the dumb ones. They charged me with everything I fucking did. So, like I said, prosecutors had wide, they have wide options. It's their discretion as to what to charge. And the evidence doesn't even have to be foolproof either. Most RICO cases have overlapping evidence and soft cases in general. How many times have you heard me say this is a soft case? And the reason why they're soft is because they don't have to prove, they don't have to have the burden of proof. Rather, a conspiracy of enterprise. That's all it takes. Prosecutors are immune to being sued civilly in RICO cases by defendants for misconduct. So they have a wall protecting them even if they lie, they capitulate, and they do things that are unethical. You can't do anything about it. The law protects them. How? (laughs) It blows my fucking mind. How is that even allowed? They can fuck up. They They can make up lies. They can give misstatements and more but they're not culpable in the same court where they can seize your home and ruin your family. And Rico laws, because we just spoke about it, those charged with loan sharking, extortion, illegal gambling, they're not charged with those crimes. You got to understand this rather they're charged with racketeering, which is a sort of a sum up of uh, all of the terms that the government uses to enhance Prosecutors do not have to prove to juries and to judges that the accused are engaged in those crimes that they're charged with, which as a rule are violations of state criminal law, technically. But all they have to do is show that it it appears, not proven, it appears that the defendants carried on those activities. The prosecution only has to meet the civil standard of preponderance of the evidence and the highest standard of that which is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt they don't even have if you're if you get arrested for murder you have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt but the civil rico standard for that is not the same all they have to do is meet the civil standard of preponderance of the evidence saying that well there's enough evidence remember when i talked about the alfred plea and when i took my alfred plea it meant that Based on what the government had as evidence, 
it would probably be overwhelming that I would be convicted. That's all they have to do in a RICO case. They don't have to prove you did it. They just have to prove that there's enough that you might have done it. That's all they fucking need. And that, you know, the the idea that that they don't have to use the highest standard in, in a federal case, which is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, that has been the required standard for criminal convictions throughout the history of the United States, but not for RICO. The original version of the RICO Act would have been unlawful. They, they, they wanted to make it unlawful to be a member of any criminal group. And the original language would have made it unconstitutional to persecute anybody for that, uh, albeit criminal, criminality or not. However, as you see, uh, they are, in fact, really doing this anyway. Uh, they just word it differently. The, the language uh, says one thing. The law statute says another And when you add with the prejudicial history inferences or references to criminal groups, you have to ask yourself, how is this accepted in the United States? Rudy Giuliani used the RICO law in ways that just blow my fucking mind. Uh, He used the RICO act to beat defendants into the ground. He used it to coerce defendants to plead guilty. Those are facts. It's not just because I don't like them. It's just facts. And those who wouldn't go along with what he said, he'd hammer them. Those who refused to rat, he would he would push them into the ground face first. He would use the RICO Act against people as a weapon to either bankrupt them, to take their homes. It would threaten to use the RICO Act to arrest the children, the wives, and the family members of alleged organized crime members unless he got his fucking way. He could drop what would be considered a nuke on anybody he felt like doing it to with little oversight or moral implications because of the way the RICO Act has been designed. Look at Vincent Gigante, who for 30 years evaded the feds. It wasn't until Giuliani used the RICO Act to arrest his son, his grandson, then threatened to arrest his whole entire family and bankrupt them that Vincent the Chin said enough is enough. But because of the weaving language in RICO, it allows the government to do exactly what they want. Don't want to fess up? Okay, your children are going to go homeless into foster care. That's Nazi-like rhetoric that the feds have used willingly to get and obtain convictions and to coerce men into becoming informants. In hundreds of cases, and listen, not all informants are like that. Some of them are just rats. They're born that way. But still, in hundreds of cases, we have seen where defendants had enough to defend themselves, but RICO was used to penalize them, to seize their assets. And when that didn't work, threats of arresting their children, putting their wives into foster care would be used against them to force them into a tailspin and to be bent at the knees because RICO's overlapping structures. Looking into cases hundreds and hundreds of times in the last 10 years alone, and if anybody doesn't believe this, I'll give you the documents. Federal agents and prosecutors have pursued justice by breaking every single law. They have broken every oath that they have have ever taken. They have lied. They have hid evidence. They have distorted facts. They have paid for perjury. They have set up innocent people knowing it, all in exchange for winning indictments, getting guilty pleas, and convictions. Look at the case of U.S. Attorney Judge Valder. This is a guy who allegedly remarked to a number, a number of people and to judges that he didn't give a fuck about the guilt or innocence of anybody that was accused. Rather, all he really cared about was the conviction rate and his own career advancement. Higher conviction rates, higher salary. Higher conviction rates, bigger position. RICO allows inept prosecutors to get convictions without almost no effort. RICO represents the worst the criminal justice system has to offer to any citizen. At any time, any place, they can do whatever the fuck they want. They can stack the deck and not be held accountable for any of it. So next week when we come back, we are going to discuss the Philadelphia indictment and we're going to talk more about RICO. We're going to talk about the hypocrisy of the RICO Act. We're going to talk about the hierarchy because that is a huge thing that is involved with RICO conspiracies. You have to prove a chain of command, but as you've learned today, you really don't have to prove it. You just have to have enough to make it look like it's that, and that's enough to get a conviction. They need to change the standards. So when we come back next week, we're going to talk about all of that. 
So reach out and let me know if you like today's show. Send me an email at mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com. It's time we stand up and we just talk about it. And I don't think anybody has talked about the RICO Act like I just did today. And it's not about guilt versus innocence. It's about proving that somebody is guilty. It should be beyond reasonable doubt, not, eh, it looks like we have enough. It shouldn't be based on the evidence they say they have. It should be corroborated. And it shouldn't be corroborated by informants. It should be corroborated by factual events. So put yourself in a defendant's chair. You're getting indicted on a jury. Do I need to go back to, to, to number 74 where Victor DeLuca walks in and hands Sonny his own money? That was enough to get Sonny indicted. They don't say the sum of money, the reason for the money. Could have been a loan, could have been this, could have been a, this, could have been that. That's enough to get you seven years in prison because of an enterprise. What if uh, this had nothing to do with the enterprise? Those are the questions that you have to ask. 